Spirit as we see him. We put it out on our uh, Facebook page what you would like to see us uh, publish video-wise uh, during uh, this extended time that you are home. And overwhelmingly, uh, our followers picked Brunswick History 101. So what you are about to see is a series of videos that covers Brunswick history uh, at the beginner level. And there are going to be about 20 or so separate videos. And the topics we are going to cover are geology, uh, Native Americans, the early names of Brunswick and settlement and settlement patterns of Brunswick. We're going to talk about how the CNO Canal and the railroad both come here in the 1830s. We're going to talk about the CNO Canal. We're going to talk about B&O Railroad up until about the 1880s. And then the B&O Railroad and this area in 1890. We're going to talk about the birth of Brunswick. Uh, then we're going to talk about the expansion of Brunswick. Where we're going to look at certain houses and architecture. We're going to look at businesses and the individual buildings and, and talk about those. We're also going to have a segment on churches and organizations. And then we're going to cover the decades, everything from the 1890s to the 2000s. So we hope you enjoy this segment. Uh, in each video post, there is a link. Uh, there is a PayPal link. And if you'd like to make a donation to the Brunswick Heritage Museum, we would greatly appreciate it. So we hope you enjoy Brunswick History 101. sessions to discuss the history of Brunswick and we're going to go back and start uh, very early and we're going to talk about the geology of Brunswick and if I can uh, we're actually on the second floor uh, this is our local history floor and I'd like to point you into a great exhibit that was uh, created by the help of a gentleman by the name of Dan Rowe uh, and let me point you here to uh, our first panel which talks about geology and Brunswick's location and what happened here 300 million years ago. Uh, the Appalachians uh, as high as today's, were as high as today's Himalayas. And then 30 million years ago, the Appalachians worn down to low hills. Um, the Potomac River meandered among the hills and the plains. And going down to our second panel, 15 million years ago, a uh, thousand feet of additional uplift uh, happened. Uh, the Potomac River cut through the gaps and through the uplifted ridges. And that is what we have today, this wonderful, beautiful uh, river, uh, which is one of Brunswick's biggest assets, uh, created water gaps through the mountain ridges uh, and they remain. And Brunswick is a calm site um, between the ridges and the gaps. And that geology will lead us into Brunswick's settling and human activity over the last thousand years. So the geology is what really gives way to what we're going to talk about in our next chapter of Brunswick History 101, which is our uh, earliest people here, the, the Native Americans. But Brunswick was situated along, or is situated along, the Potomac River, the hard rock base of the ancient mountains, uh, which we're going to go over some of those hard rock bases here in just a little bit. Um, shallow, minimal rapids, uh, access via the low river terraces, north and south shores. And the logical location for the Native American fish traps that were put in, German settlers uh, that forded the Potomac to Virginia. Um, it made for the location for the canal and the rail routes through the mountains. Um, the Union Army, using this area for Civil War camp resupply, crossing the Potomac, um, and then the river bridge crossing, um, multiple river bridges. So you can see how the geology actually played out to um, 
to basically being the formation of why we're all here today. And a couple examples that we have here on the table uh, for those hard rock bases is an uh, example of quartz. Um, and then we also have some examples of other uh, rocks, um, other minerals, and including granite. So that is the first video in our Brunswick History 101 session, um, geology, the geology of Brunswick. If you ever have any questions, please post them at the bottom of this post. You can direct uh, message us. Um, and if, you, if I forgot anything or you want to add, uh, add your own comments, please feel free to do so. This is interactive. Um, and our next session, um, our session two, will be on the local Native Americans who populated the area we now know as Brunswick. Thank you all very much. James Castle from the Brunswick Heritage Museum and uh, you are watching Brunswick History 101. This is the second in our series, our first in our series talked about Brunswick geology which led us naturally now to talk about our what's highlighted in series two is our Native Americans. Um, to be honest I have to start with uh, what uh, we know and don't know and we actually do not know more than what we know. Um, the Native Americans uh, in this area were Susquehannocks. Uh, they were Iroquois stock. Um, and that is very much kind of the limit to what we know. Um, you know, there were Susquehannans living uh, in the Chesapeake Bay area, um, but I would have to assume that the same natives uh, that were located in the Chesapeake Bay area and the same natives that were located uh, here along the Potomac certainly lived different lives. We know that they were creek dwellers. Um, a lot of these artifacts that you are seeing were actually found in near local creek beds. Um, and uh, these Native American artifacts are very popular. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, digging uh, on National Park Service property is illegal and you should not do it. Um, again, a lot of these artifacts were found in people's yards and in the creek beds. And in fact, I'll highlight a few of these for you. Um, we can do the uh, look at the handheld hammerstone uh, that was used for striking and cracking nuts. Uh, we have a hand axe that was used to remove bark from trees to make boats uh, and their wig bombs. This one was actually found uh, in Brunswick, I'm sorry, in Point of Rocks. Also found in Point of Rocks is what's known as a sharpening stone. Uh, the stone groove was used to sharpen deer antlers uh, and, and arrow shafts. Um, scrapers uh, were used to clean animal skins found along the Potomac River. And uh, this one was found near the Brunswick Bridge uh, fish trap, which uh, we will we'll talk about as well. Uh, this fishing arrowhead, uh, there's a, an example of a sucker, which would have been uh, one of the uh, more popular or the most uh, predominant fish in the Potomac at the time. These arrowheads, actually these two were actually found by me in Brunswick. Uh, this Indian hammer was actually found by me uh, also in Brunswick. And then shards of pottery. These shards of pottery pieces have actually been found in Brunswick and Knoxville um, uh, many, many over the years. So the one thing that we have that is the evidence of our native population uh, is the fact that they left things for us to find. And one of those things are the Native American fish traps. And uh, that is a typical fish trap basket. Um, the fish traps in Brunswick area, there's two that I can highlight here, but this is one near the Brunswick campground. Um, this is an aerial 
a photograph from 1937 that actually shows it in the river. And then here is the one located near the Brunswick Bridge. Um, this is a view, if you were actually looking at it um, from the uh, view, view of the water. And of course, this most likely was not an Indian or a Native American village. Uh, this was actually a hunting location. So they would have traveled here. Um, they would have caught their fish uh, through a process of many, many people working, taking it to a, a temporary camp on the riverbank and then drying out the fish as uh, fast as possible to move it. In his book, uh, released just last year, uh, local Don, uh, native Don uh, Peterson uh, produced this book called Native American Fish Traps in the Potomac River. Um, it is a great read. Uh, it's very in-depth on the subject. It's available at the Brunswick Heritage Museum uh, store um, if you would like a copy of it. They sell for $15 uh, a copy. 100% of the proceeds go to the museum. And if you need it uh, during the time of closure um, for the museum, you can always just direct message or, or stick a message in the uh, Facebook comments. I'd also like to highlight this wonderful uh, reproduction of a Native American fish trap, which would have been used in the Brunswick area fish traps. This was uh, recreated by Don Peterson uh, to demonstrate how the fish would swim into the fish trap and would not be able to get back out. Uh, that is it for uh, our second session here on the second floor with our local history on Brunswick History 101. Uh, if I miss something, uh, feel free to comment. Feel free to comment about, you know, uh, anything you would like to add to the subject. Uh, also, um, direct message us if you'd like, if you're a little shy. Uh, again, thank you very much. We appreciate you watching. Have a good day. History 101 series. Uh, my name is James Castle. I'm the president of the Brunswick Heritage Museum and this is the third in our series. Our first uh, episode was on the geology of Brunswick. Our second episode was the Native Americans uh, that habitated uh, this area. And then our third series is the many many names of our area here now known as Brunswick. This is probably the most common conversation that happens right here in this location where we're at. We are in the CNO Canal Visitor Center section of the Brunswick Heritage Museum. And so let me talk, let's discuss a few of the former names of uh, the area that we now know as Brunswick. So first and foremost, uh, there were folks here traveling through in the 1720s, uh, one uh, primarily by the name of Abraham Pennington, who was a trader who was here for a very short amount of time. But uh, this area was referred to by the natives as Buffalo Wallows. Uh, Buffalo Wallows meant basically, uh, literally, a place where buffaloes uh, stood and wallowed in the water, the Potomac River. And um, interestingly enough, buffalo remains have actually been found in uh, the Potomac River down where the Brunswick campsite is today. Uh, another Native American name of this area was Ilpot, and in the second series, you actually saw uh, an eel basket, uh, a fish basket, that was up on the second floor in our Native display. Uh, it was also called Ilpot Ford, so uh, folks passing through here, uh, settlers, uh, actually knew of the Native American term of Ilpot, and where they forded the river actually was called Ilpot Ford. The official land grant uh, that was granted to this area was Mary Hawkins Peepo Day. Uh, kind of a funny little name, um, 
but that is exactly what the land grant was called. We then uh, have the terminology of German crossing, which was the location uh, where the uh, German settlers were crossing over in the Potomac into Virginia, which is uh, in Lovettsville is known as the German settlement. We then come to the German use of the city name of Berlin for our little village. Uh, that was given by a name by the name of Leonard Smith, which we will talk about in a future um, uh, series, actually our next episode. Uh, Berlin got a little confusing because there's another Berlin on the eastern shore right outside of Ocean City. And so the postmaster at one time even tried to call this area P.O. Barry, B-A-R-R-Y. Um, and eventually when the railroad um, makes the decision to move its main yard operation here uh, in the late 1880s. In 1890, this area is renamed by uh, the B&O Railroad uh, as Brunswick. And we will talk about the birth of Brunswick in a future episode. So that is the, uh, oh, and you know what? I can't forget one uh, nickname that was given to Brunswick after uh, the name changed, but you'll hear Brunswick uh, commonly referred to as Smoketown. And then you'll also see Smoketown used as the Smoketown Brewery. Uh, you'll, uh, there's a local band by the name of Smoketown. I even had a company called Smoketown Publishers at one time. So Smoketown, Smoketown, what, what does Smoketown mean? So Smoketown was the essence of Brunswick during its heyday when the steam engines were coming through, when the factories, and when I say the factories, the railroad buildings were uh, operating um, and the massive amounts of smoke that were produced that actually you know covered uh, the area of town in fact uh, a lot of uh, folks uh, who the ladies um, housewives uh, were uh, planned their wash around the schedule of the trains so they didn't get smoke and soot on their clothes so that's where the uh, the term smoke town comes from I hope you enjoyed the session about nicknames. If I missed any, please uh, add it to the comments. Please comment anything you would like. Uh, also, um, you can direct message us if you're shy. And uh, we hope to you check out a future uh, episode in the series of Brunswick History 101. Thank you. to Brunswick History 101. My name is James Castle. I'm the president of the Brunswick Heritage Museum. In our last episode, we talked about names of Brunswick, and in that episode, we got to the town name or the village name of Berlin. Let's take a look at this map, and we'll talk about Berlin uh, in uh, more detail. So this map, let me go on this side. So this map uh, was a labor of love by a gentleman by the name of Arthur Lutman. And Arthur Lutman had a paint store on West Potomac Street, and it was a gathering spot for the locals to talk. And Arthur uh, took those local stories, and he did a lot of research, and he created this map that basically shows every lot plotted by Leonard Smith uh, in 1787, who named this area Berlin. Uh, and then wrote down all of the landowners of said lot, uh, for the most part, up to 1890, maybe and some uh, a little bit beyond that. So let me highlight Berlin here for you on the map. I know this might be a little difficult, but let's get our street bearings. So this street right here was known as High Street, and later it was called Upper Street, and now we know it as Potomac Street. Um, a street below uh, was Water Street and later Railroad Street. Uh, the street obviously does not uh, exist anymore. Um, and then the three other streets uh, going north and south was First Street, uh, which is now Virginia Avenue. Then you had Second Street, which is now Maryland Avenue. And then you had Third Street, which is now Maple Avenue. And the area I want to concentrate on is this grand area right here. So the railroad tracks were later put in, in the 1830s, right here. And all of this right now is commuter parking lot up into the canal and then the Potomac River. 
So what kind of things were in this old section of Berlin? And some interesting names that pop out here is Swank and George, which had the Brunswick's hardware store, or actually Berlin's hardware store. Um, the, uh, they bought this uh, land in 1902. Uh, so we are in uh, the Brunswick uh, time period for that. Um, this is the area where the lock house is now lo or was located. You have Hotel Elgin. So there's a hotel there in the old Berlin section. Another interesting name that shows up on this lot is that of Abraham Blessing, uh, who looks like he owned it from about 1820 to 1893. And we're going to see an example of an old photograph. Uh, the Blessing family, uh, which I am actually related to, were known as photographers. And we actually have some photographs that, uh, that have Blessing uh, photography on it, uh, Brunswick, Maryland. Uh, some other names down here is the Brunswick Herald, uh, which was the Brunswick newspaper, uh, had a very um, well-known editor, uh, Mr. Schaefer. Um, his, uh, his office uh, was there, it was a very grand, grandiose building. Um, so continuing with some other um, um, prominent uh, or well-known businesses in the old Berlin area is Alder Store. A very famous photograph that we have in our collection is uh, that of Alder Store right here at, uh, at this corner. Uh, the Opera House, which was really the precursor of the Brunswick Redmen's Hall, which is now the Brunswick Heritage Museum. The Opera House was Berlin's uh, main social building. Uh, it actually had a club uh, on the third floor, the second floor was the Opera House, and the first floor was uh, businesses, most prominently a bank and also uh, Victor Kaplan's first store. Um, interesting uh, footnote about the Opera House is that so many people packed the second floor for shows that the, the floors actually started buckling and the building was condemned. You can see P.B. Crampton uh, down here uh, owning these two lots uh, and then site of the mill and then uh, another interesting uh, section over here uh, a lot of things you know it has the the um, landowners but it doesn't necessarily always have uh, the businesses that were here and some very interesting businesses were, were located down here including uh, what they termed a Chinese laundry uh, and then also you can see the boarding house that was here, Lucas's boarding house, and uh, um, a land owned by Leander Barger, who was a uh, Civil War veteran and also worked on the Sino Canal. So at the same time, uh, you can see that up here in these upper sections uh, developed, um, a lot of things were vacant up here on this, what we now call the main street because the emphasis was down here uh, where the commuter lot is now. Um, Leonard Smith plotted these 90 plus lots in 1787 and in future uh, sessions, we're actually going to uh, take a walk on the street and highlight some of the, uh, some of the houses, the earliest houses that are shown on this map. Um, so, we thank you all very much. I know that might have been a little difficult. Um, we'll continue to improve uh, this session. Uh, but we thank you for watching this uh, session on Berlin. And uh, we thank you very much for watching.
everybody. Welcome to Brunswick History 101. Uh, we're actually going to uh, start to focus in on some artifacts that we have here and displays in the Brunswick Heritage Museum. Uh, this is actually being filmed on a Saturday, and Saturday is haircut day. Where you would have went for your haircut would have been down to the Brunswick YMCA, uh, to the barber shop. Now the Brunswick YMCA was one of the most loved buildings in Brunswick. Uh, it was a place where uh, you would go for food. It was a place where you would go to get your hair cut. It was a place where the uh, locals congregated uh, and also the railroaders. Uh, they also opened up their building to the local organizations. So the local organizations had a place to meet. Uh, it was so busy uh, at the Brunswick YMCA. It was tw open 24 hours a day. Uh, its main goal was to serve the railroader, but again, it served the entire community. Um, there, we have in our records where, uh, you know, 26 cakes uh, were baked every other day. Um, and you can see here with the, uh, the uh, restaurant display that we have, uh, with the menus and what the restaurant looked inside, um, the railroad also had a hospital with the hospital annex um, hooked uh, to the side. Uh, railroad industry was so business, biz, uh, dangerous uh, that it actually needed its own um, hospital. The Y uh, had two fires in its history, uh, but the last one that happened in 1980 uh, was the one that uh, finally ended the beloved uh, YMCA. Uh, we have a picture on the wall uh, that uh, shows the YMCA fire, uh, the nights uh, in 1980 where it uh, was destroyed. And uh, interestingly enough, we have what was saved and salvaged out of that uh, building was this wonderful stained glass window uh, that is on display here on the second floor, uh, what is now known as Eagles Hall, here at the uh, Brunswick Heritage Museum. Uh, the YMCA certainly lives in the hearts of many folks here in Brunswick, and, uh, and we enjoy continuing to tell its story. So with haircut finished, uh, it is time to say thank you for tuning in to this edition of uh, Brunswick History 101 where we start to um, review some of our artifacts and displays. We hope you tune in again and we hope you enjoyed this. Feel free to comment in the comment section, add your memories of the Brunswick YMCA. Uh, perhaps I missed something. Uh, perhaps you'd like to chime in. Uh, that train in the background is real. Uh, so have a great day and thank you for tuning in. Hi everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Brunswick 101. Um, we are going to focus on our churches this Sunday. We're going to start uh, with the history of the Methodist Church. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, in the comment section, uh, please leave your memories of uh, the Methodist Church. And uh, if you can leave a donation, we'd also appreciate that as well. Thank you very much and enjoy. Interestingly enough, when Leonard Smith, a Catholic, platted his village of Berlin, he dedicated no lot for a church. In fact, the land designated for a cemetery was located right outside of Berlin. Although no church, the early G German settlers of the area were pious people. If only one book was possessed, it was the Bible. Songs sang would have been hymns, morning, noon, evening meal, and night would have been celebrated with prayer. All teachings of children included moral lessons found in the Old Testament. 
In early Berlin, families would have celebrated the Sabbath in their own home and later traveling to other houses to worship in groups. Finally, in 1850, Lydia Ann Poole sold to the trustees of the Methodist Episcopal Church lot number 30 on what is now located on Maryland Avenue. The cost was $200 and the lot contained an unfinished log home, which the church finished in 1851. The village of 300 residents now had its first Berlin church. The first pastor, Reverend Joseph Spangler, traveled to Berlin by horse and buggy and sometimes by canal boat. The first Sunday school service was organized in 1852 by B.F. Sigafus and Miss Mary Virginia Hogan. The building was used for 20 years and the sanctuary was on the main floor, was used for whites, and the balcony was used for slaves and free blacks. During the Civil War, the structure was used as a hospital after the Battle of Antietam. With a growing population, the site of the present sanctuary was purchased from Mary and Adam Riddenball for $60 in 1870. The church, now built for 150 people, last served until 1893. Other denominations who were trying to form held services here, including the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, and the Reformed Church. In 1893, services began on the East End in New York Hill area. Due to the growth of Brunswick, the church needed to grow, and in 1893, the church was remodeled and the belfry was built. The current brick building was built in 1907. In 1938, the church purchased the uh, adjoining lot and an educational unit was built in 1941. In 1989, First Methodist Church joined with the New York Hill Methodist Church. Later, that church was sold and the Methodist Church now hopes to build a church on Olive School Road. Well, that's it uh, for the history of the Methodist Church. We hope you enjoyed this special session of Brunswick History 101. Uh, join us next Sunday where we actually will be talking about the history of the Catholic Church. So we hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much. James Castle from the Brunswick Heritage Museum. Welcome to this episode of Brunswick History 101. I was just uh, admiring one of my favorite uh, items in my personal collection. This is a photograph uh, taken at the Harpers Ferry Lock in 1889. Um, it shows a canal boat going through the lock, the old Salty Dog Tavern, um, the canal house. Um, a lot of the raw infrastructure that was put in and the other thing that's amazing is the mountainside that it took to uh, to actually blast and uh, to put this infrastructure in so that leads us to what uh, today's episode is going to be about today's episode is going to be about two uh, major corporations coming to Brunswick at the same time uh, in 1834 um, and ironically uh, starting uh, at the same time, July 4th, 1828. And this will lead us up to how the B&O Railroad and the Sino Canal both come to Brunswick in 1834. Enjoy. It was George Washington's dream of channeling out the Potomac River for more transportation from the West than the rafts and flatboats were providing in the 1700s. That dream was never realized, but nearly 30 years after his death, the CNO Canal came very close to meeting his dream. With the state's independence secured at the end of the American Revolution, the nation was ready to grow west to the Ohio River. Standing in the way was the formidable Allegheny Mountain Range. Although George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and influential Virginians 
all saw the Potomac River as an important connection between the eastern colonies and the west, the National Road from Baltimore had already reached the Ohio River at Wheeling, Virginia, and was being used by hundreds of thousands of settlers to travel west. Those roads worked for people, but it wasn't as effective for moving goods. In fact, hauling cargo over land was more than 30 times more expensive than flatwater canal transport. In 1785, Washington chartered the Potomac Company, spelled P-A-T-O-W-M-A-C, as a nod to the Native American spelling of the river. With the purpose of clearing the river channel and building skirting canals around the river's more turbulent sections. But the country had other plans for Washington. After chairing the Constitutional Convention, Washington was elected as the first president of the United States in 1789. He appointed his friend, Thomas Johnson, to fill out his post as president of the Potomac Company, but kept an eye on the difficult work being done there. After two terms as president, Washington returned to the Potomac Company, but lack of funds slowed down progress, especially the difficult channel around Great Falls. In 1799, at about the same time Maryland legislature purchased additional stock in the company, Washington died. Three years later, the locks of Great Falls were opened to the Potomac at the last, and at last became a navigable route. Early canal construction by the Potomac Company consisted of building navigable skirting canals on the Potomac River around some of its formidable rapids at Harper's Ferry, Seneca, Little Falls, and especially Great Falls. Probably the greatest challenge was the skirting canal at Great Falls, where the Potomac Company blasted through solid rock on the Virginia side. The Great Falls locks were applauded by, in European technical journals as engineering feats of their time. With skirting canals in place, a keelboat could travel from Cumberland to Georgetown in about four days. After the War of 1812, the first order of business was better internal transportation. Lack of navigation along the seacoast proved challenging for the U.S. Navy during the war, and Army had been held back as well. Virginia Congressman Charles Fenton Mercer led an effort to pass a resolution for a continuous canal up the Potomac. President James Monroe was impressed with the plan, and the U.S. engineers were asked to study the proposal. The estimated price tag for the canal was $22 million, which was unheard of for that period of time. Canal lobbyists asked for another estimate by another group of engineers that reduced the estimate to $4.5 million, taking the canal as far as Cumberland. With the very first shovel full of dirt, the construction of the Ceno Canal proved to be fraught with difficulty. Groundbreaking for the canal took place on July 4, 1828, near Little Falls. After much fanfare, lavish meals for attending officials, a boat ride up the Potomac, and speeches, President John Quincy Adams dug in and hit rocks and roots in his first attempt before he was successful. The groundbreaking was difficult and was only a sign of the challenges ahead. The canal company was committed to building 100 miles of canal in just five years. No large-scale construction companies existed to take on the project. There were no detailed engineer drawings, just lists of written specifications and in many sections, the raw resources used to build locks were scarce. Still, Americans were determined to build this waterway west. More than 462 proposals were submitted by close to 100 different contractors. Businesses such as sawmills were established along the route to support construction. It was the beginning of a long, difficult journey. Construction of the canal reached Berlin in 1834. Lots near the river were sold to the Sino Canal by Perry Hillary in 1836, Daniel Willard in 1838, John McPherson in 1840, and Jonathan Stambeck in 1846. The fast-growing port city of Baltimore, Maryland faced economic stagnation unless it opened routes to the western states. Two men, Philip E. Thomas and George Brown, were the pioneers of the b and Railroad. They spent the year 1826 investigating railway enterprises in England, which were at the time being tested in a comprehensive fashion as commercial ventures. Their investigation completed, they had an organizational meeting on February 12, 1827, 
including about 25 citizens, most of whom were Baltimore merchants or bankers. Chapter 123 of the 1826 Session Laws of Maryland passed February 28, 1827, and the Commonwealth of Virginia on March 8, 1827, chartered the B&O Railroad Company with the task of building a railroad from the Port of Baltimore west to a suitable point on the Ohio River. The railroad, formerly incorporated April 24th, was intended to provide faster route for goods. Thomas was elected as the first president and Brown the treasurer. The B&O was initially capitalized in 1827 with a $3 million issue of stock. Virtually every citizen of Baltimore owned a share. Construction began on July 4, 1828, when Charles Carroll of Carrollton, one of the last living signers of the Declaration of Independence, performed the groundbreaking and laying of the cornerstone. The first section, from Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills, opened on May 24, 1830. A horse pulled the first 26 miles of track and back, since the B&O did not decide to use steam power for several years. The B&O's first locomotive, the Tom Thumb, was made in America and would pull passenger and freight cars at 18 miles per hour. Developers decided to follow the Patapsco River to a point near Pars Ridge, now known as Mount Airy, where the railroad would cross a height of land and descend into the valley of the Monocacy and Potomac Rivers. Further extensions opened to Frederick on December 1, 1831, Point of Rocks on April 2, 1832, and Berlin and Sandy Hook in 1834. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, future episodes will actually talk more about the B&O Railroad leading up to 1890, and another episode will talk about uh, the Sino Canal and its operations in Berlin and Brunswick. Um, if you can, uh, if you are enjoying these uh, episodes, please uh, feel free to donate via PayPal. Uh, and we appreciate you watching and tune in to a future episode. Thank you. Castle here from the Brunswick Heritage Museum. In our last episode of Brunswick History 101, we saw where the B&O Railroad and the CNO Canal arrived in Berlin in 1834 at the same time. This episode is going to concentrate more on the rest of the history of the CNO Canal. 25 years ago, I thought the CNO Canal was just a big ditch uh, near the Potomac River. Then I met a local historian named Dave McIntosh who educated me on the subject. I grabbed some books, started reading, and it really opened up my eyes to this history that's often overshadowed by the b &O Railroad. So I hope you enjoy this episode, and we'll see you in a little bit. Both the c &O Canal and the b &O Railroad reached Berlin in 1834. The railroad built a warehouse and employed a local section gang. Berlin then thrived due to the CNO Canal. Over the years, the canal boosted the agricultural economy, assisted by a flourishing flouring mill and enslaved labor. The CNO Canal finished construction to Cumberland in 1850, eight years after the B&O had arrived. The canal, along with the railroad, moved goods during the Civil War. Berlin was certainly a canal town into the 1870s, with a population of around 300 in several businesses. Berlin Brunswick claimed the mile marker 55 along the CNO Canal as well as lock 30 of the 74 lift locks along the route. The lock was 100 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 16 feet deep to accommodate a canal boat of 92 feet long and 14 feet wide. The cost of constructing lock 30 was approximately $14,000. The lock house was 50 feet north of the lock. Life on a canal boat was rough and many times a family affair. Children were tied to the boat to prevent them from falling into the water. Children as young as six drove a two to three mule team. Women would steer the canal boat while washing clothes. 
A lock tender earned from $100 per year to $75 per month with a house and garden. Boat captains earned $0.40 cents per ton from Washington. A laborer received $10 to $20 per month with poor food, housing, and medical care. In 1845, the following quantities were shipped along the canal. Flour, 170,000 barrels. Plaster, 4,721 tons. Corn, 126,000 bushels. Wheat, 300,000 bushels. Oats, 35,000 bushels. Lumber, over 1 million feet of board measure. 2,500 bushels of potatoes. 118,000 bricks. 15,250 pounds of pork. And 1,351 bushels of oyster. In 1917, 174,000 tons of toll coal was transported. After 1870, the railroad's investment in improving its technology allowed it to surge ahead of its competitor. The canal deteriorated during the Civil War. In 1869, the company's annual report said, quote, During the last 10 years, little or nothing has been done toward repairing the improve and improving lockhouses, culverts, aqueducts, locks, lock gates, and waste weirs of the company, unquote. While the canal had fierce competition with the railroad, there was another competitor that was a relentless foe, Mother Nature. The canal was severely damaged during the Johnstown flood of 1889. Seizing the opportunity, the canal was purchased by the B&O Railroad, mainly to prevent the right-of-way from other railroads. The canal held its own after Berlin became Brunswick and the railroad created a boom town, but many canal families migrated elsewhere, favoring a more agricultural landscape to that of a city. The flood of 1924 put a halt to the canal's operation and the flood of 1936 further damaged the wrecked, abandoned canal. The canal was sold by the B&O Railroad Company to the United States government for $2 million in 1938. The government planned to restore it as a recreation area. Additionally, it was viewed as a project for employment for the jobless during the Great Depression. By 1940, the first 22 miles of the canal were repaired and rewatered. World War II sidetracked the project, and post-war planning almost turned what we know today as the Sino Canal National Historic Park into a freeway a plan opposed by many, including Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. In 1954, Douglas led a group of hikers for a hike along the canal, bringing much attention to the cause of creating a national park. In 1961, President Eisenhower named the canal a national monument, and in 1974, President Nixon signed the legislation creating the CNO Canal National Historic Park. Today, the CNO Canal offers hiking, biking, access to the Potomac River for fishing and boating, nature watching, and an all-around outdoor recreation for countless people along its historic past. In Brunswick, the CNO Canal Visitor Center was established 20 years ago and offers visitors historic interpretation, canal information, comfort facilities, and access to the Brunswick Heritage Museum. Well, we hope you enjoyed that episode of the History of the CNO Canal. Our next episode will actually concentrate on the B&O Railroad up into the year of 1890. Uh, we hope you enjoy these Brunswick History 101 episodes. Uh, if you can, uh, please send a donation to uh, us via PayPal at admin at brunswickmuseum.org. Thank you very much. <laughs>
items that we have on display in uh, areas. And this is a recreation of the WB Tower that we created here on in Eagles Hall on the second floor of the Brunswick Heritage Museum. Um, you'll see the WB window here in the back. And uh, we recreated this desk area to really mimic uh, what a worker in WB Tower would have been doing at that time. You can see the um, telegraph equipment uh, with the telephone and we've re tried, did our best to recreate all of that here. Two other items I'd like to really, really highlight here, maybe even more than that, uh, but here is an example of what our train engineer would have been wearing. Uh, he had a pair of work boots, he has his coveralls on, his uh, denim jacket, his railroader hat, uh, and he's ready for his, uh, he's got his lunch that he would actually uh, take on the train as well. Um, in the back there, I don't know if you see the, uh, the box but that's actually called a grip and that's where he would have had uh, work papers his personal items and things like that as well one great highlight uh, here at the museum is this full um, 1950s 1960s version of a complete B&O Railroad police officers uniform this uniform was donated to us by Bernie Birch uh, it is absolutely complete uh, with the exception of a uh, firearm um, but it is a wonderful example uh, of a complete uniform including the coat and we also have a picture here of Mr. Birch wearing uniform uh, when he was a, a b and uh, a police officer. Mr. Birch actually got a chance to see this uh, artifact on display. He passed away not too much uh, later um, and we're glad he got a chance to see it. One other item I can quickly, uh, or maybe even two, that we can highlight is you can see the B&O Railroad mailbag in the back that would have been picked up by a passing train. And then the other interesting item here is you have to remember before the age of telephones, uh, this is a message hoop. And so a person working in the tower would type up a message and uh, the... Um, uh, the hoop was placed out and someone on the train coming through was going to have to take their arm and actually grab this um, and pull the message off and throw the hoop back out. Uh, this could have been, this message could have been as unimportant as there's mail at the next station to pick up, but it could be as important as there's a train stopped in front of you and you need to stop or you're going to crash. So actually the ability to pick up this hoop while moving was very important. We thank you for tuning in to this session of Brunswick History 101, the Brunswick Heritage Museum. I'm James Castle, uh, president of the board. Um, we hope you enjoyed this session and please uh, feel free to comment uh, if I missed something or if you got some comments or memories of uh, of WB Tower, of engineers and conductors, of uh, Bernie Birch or Brun uh, b &O police officers or the mail service, uh, go ahead and leave those comments and we appreciate you tuning in. Thank you.